What if you had a couple million dollars stored on a piece of silicon the size of a postage stamp, and it was protected by a password that you forgot? Chips like this are in all sorts of different types of hardware wallets out there that are supposed to be used to protect your recovery seeds and your private information in the world of cryptocurrency. But a lot of people forget their passwords. And if you forget your password, if you can't access the information on the chip, you're out of luck, you're out of money. That's the problem we're dealing with today. Some guys contacted me out of the blue. They have a Trezor hardware wallet and they have a couple million dollars stored on a device like this and they want me to see if I can hack the wallet, defeat the security, and get access to the information so they can prove that the money is theirs. I'm Joe Grand, I'm a hardware hacker, computer engineer. Hacking a product like this is an amazing challenge. It's like solving a puzzle, and we really only have one chance to do it right. Joe, what's happening? Um, sorry, let me, I, I gotta take the electrical tape off my camera. <laughs> um, how's it going? Good man, get to connect and talk shop and hopefully make some progress on this stuff. Are you, uh, are you excited? Yeah, you know, in my mind, honestly, I've, I've told myself that uh, whatever happens one way or the other is gonna be a great story. It's just gonna be a question of if it's gonna be a really expensive story or, <laughs> or not, but either way, it's gonna be one for the memory books. Yeah, hacking is nothing like what you see in the movies. There's not graphical things moving all over the place. It doesn't take a split second for something to happen. It's a huge roller coaster ride. It's solving puzzles. It's forcing computers and forcing hardware to do things that they weren't expecting to do. You want them to misbehave in a way that you can control. Contract looks good. I think the changes we wanted that are now accounted for. For me, as you know, the main thing was just like getting that waiver of liability so you're not gonna sue me if something goes wrong. <laughs> for this project, I've been working 12 weeks to try to defeat the security in a way that's reliable and that isn't, hopefully, going to erase the contents of the device. Now that we're here and we're filming it and Dan is on his way and we're gonna do the real thing, there's a lot that can go wrong. You have the device, you got it from Jesse. Yep. The main thing that I'm kind of worried about, bringing it through the x-ray um, and maintaining control of it. For the x-ray, like, you know, the, most electronics is gonna be x-ray safe. It's not like they're using super powerful x-ray. What I've done a lot of times is like ask for a manual inspection. Yeah, this thing isn't leaving my side. What I'm doing with this attack is kind of like disabling an alarm system in a museum and stealing the jewels. Except actually, it's like somebody made an exact copy of the jewels, put them behind a locked door, and then I went and kicked in the door and stole the jewels, but then the original jewels are still there. It's a little bit crazy. Yeah, sweet. So I fly out, 8.15 flight tomorrow. Don't drop the token. <laughs> Honestly, I'm more afraid of losing and, and or dropping or misplacing the token and then the thing getting fried in, in security. I'm gonna I'm gonna duct tape it probably to my own. Well, don't duct tape it because that will- I'm literally generate, gonna duct tape yeah, it. But any sort of tape will generate static electricity, which we don't, we don't wanna do. One of the most important things to me being a hacker is to discover some superpower and then educate other people about it, inspire other people about it, and help people using my skills. When I was a kid, that was not the case. I got arrested for all sorts of computer-related things, and it was doing a lot of what I call technological juvenile delinquency. But now that I know that I can use my superpowers for good and help people, that's the beauty of hacking. I'm informed that within 30 minutes, the seven of you could uh, make the internet unusable for the entire nation. Is that correct? That's correct. Good morning. My name is Kingpin. I am the youngest member of the loft and one of the electrical engineers and hardware hackers. There's no malicious intent. There's no criminal intent. It's to help these guys who have lost their password get their money. I'll see you tomorrow. Have a great flight. Be safe. Protect that treasure. Will do. Before we go forward, let's go back to the basics. Cryptocurrency is a decentralized system of digital currency. Unlike traditional financial systems where trust of the currency is based on banks and governments, with cryptocurrency, the trust is based on the strength of the cryptography that it uses. The type of cryptography that's used in cryptocurrency systems varies depending on the cryptocurrency, but generally it falls into public key cryptography. You have two pieces of your key. The private key is something you keep to yourself and you use that to sign the transaction to prove that you initiated it. The public key, which is derived from the private key is used to verify the transaction. The blockchain is a type of technology that's used with cryptocurrency as basically a decentralized digital ledger. So every time there's a transaction that happens, it's public 
and the ledger cannot be changed. In the case of Dan and Jesse, they lost their private key because that's something that's stored on their physical hardware wallet. A hardware wallet is essentially a general purpose computer that's storing your private key. But if you forget your password to your hardware wallet, you're kind of screwed, unless you find somebody like me. Good morning. Today is the day I'm gonna hack this wallet and we get to see if the three months of work was worth it. So it's about 5.30 in the morning and I'm just waiting for my taxi to pick me up. Are you into crypto coins at all? Oh no, I'm so afraid about that. I'm kind of just pacing around my office. Even though I know it's possible, it's still scary. A few years ago, a friend of mine and I were investing in buying some crypto coins. Not Bitcoin, one of these other unique coins that we wanted to buy, so we put a little bit of money into it. It's funny, my wife actually came in today and she said, Joe, have you read your horoscope? And I'm like, no, I don't really read my horoscope. For some reason, she read the horoscope and it said something for Virgos, beware of problems with technology. You had to put it on one of these hard wallets that kind of looked like a USB stick. Time went on, the price of these coins went up and, and up and up. In other news, I just sliced my hand taking out the trash. It's not my soldering hand, which is good. I hit him up and said, time to free the coin, sell him and give me my money back. It turns out he forgot the password so he couldn't send me my money back. I do have all of my Trezor devices over here that I've been using for the various attacks. The one that's set up like this is what's gonna be used for Dan's attack. The irony of it all is my friend that lost the password plays poker professionally for a living. So he has he has like photographic memory. He remembers everything. He remembers my license plate from high school. And of all things, forgot a, a four digit pin password for this device. Let's clear the air for today. So long story short, I'm going to fly to Portland, Oregon because I met some engineer hacker online. All right, let's go to the security. Who's gonna hack this device and try to free all these coins. So Dan is on his way from New Jersey and I hope he didn't put the Trezor through the x-ray. I just made it through airport security. The device did have to go through the x-ray machine, which is no big deal because computers scan and all my <laughs> other devices can. <laughs> So Dan is on the way with the wallet. <laughs> Dan's coming and he's driving down the street backwards. Did you drive this way all the way from the airport? What's up? Did you drive this way? <laughs> How's it going? Nice meeting you. I know. Great. You exist. You got the thing? I got the thing. Awesome. I heard you had to put it through the x-ray machine. I did put it through the x-ray machine. <laughs> right, right. Why No, I'm good. Thanks. Yeah, what are you guys filming? Um, we are, you want to tell them? We're, ha we're hacking a, uh, a hardware wallet that has a lot of cryptocurrency on it. Huh. He forgot his password. Well, I didn't forget <laughs> the password. My friend forgot his the password. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's begin. So to add insult to injury on this whole thing, with the Trezor hard wallet, if you attempt the password incorrectly too many times, the contents of the wallet will erase. And so we scoured the earth and Google to try to find people that could help. It turns out our most promising leads came down to Joe, this hacker we found on Google. And then these other guys in Europe, they are based in Switzerland at some secret lab where they would perform the attack. When I asked them if I can come to the lab to see what they were doing and ensure that this was legitimate and real, they said that they couldn't do that. I was willing enough for them to even like put a bag over my head and bring me to this lab just so I can see that they were not gonna seal the device and actually do the work. And right around that time, Joe started to make progress and for the first time show that he was able to crack the device. And all the while, Joe was incredibly transparent with how he was performing the work. Very quickly, it was clear he was engaged. That's why I got on a plane this morning and came to Portland to hopefully free the coins. I tell people I'm a technology minimalist or like a technological curmudgeon because I know too much. There's a lot of stories of people forgetting their passwords of hardware wallets and losing a whole lot of money. This one was actually from 2017. A friend of mine, Mark Braunfelder, had 7.4 Bitcoins that were worth $3,000 
and he had written his recovery seed on a piece of paper and the cleaning, uh, cleaning person came, threw that out, and he's like, that's okay, I still remember my pin. But it turns out he also forgot his pin. Once he found somebody who could hack it, it was worth $32,000. And it just shows that this was four years ago when cryptocurrency was in its infancy, this was still happening. Here's another one. This one, man makes last ditch effort to recover 280 million in Bitcoin he accidentally threw out. So this guy had 7,500 Bitcoins. His private key was on a hard drive. He had two hard drives that looked identical and it turns out he threw the wrong one out. He realized after a couple months that the drive was missing. The interesting thing is that the hard drive is in the local garbage dump. It's a needle in a really disgusting haystack. Man has two guesses to unlock Bitcoin worth $240 million. This is not uncommon, and these are just the major stories. And he wrote his password down on a piece of paper that he has lost. Crazy. I, I would almost guarantee with extreme certainty that we could hack something like that. Especially for that amount of money, we'll figure it out. For the Trezor One device that I'm hacking on, there have been exploits developed over time to break security of the device. So when Dan contacted me and said, hey, can you break the, the Trezor? I was like, sure. I thought I'd be able to replicate some of the work that was out there. What ended up happening is a long tail of three months of effort of trial and error and trying different techniques until I got it right. I knew that the attack would need to take advantage of something called fault injection, where we're basically causing misbehavior on the silicon chip inside of the device in order to defeat security. And what ended up happening is I was sitting here watching the computer screen and saw that I was able to defeat the security, the private information, the recovery seed and the pin that I was going after popped up on the screen. I kind of didn't think it was right because that's not what I was trying to do and ended up mentioning it to my wife later on. She's like, well, so you did it. And I'm like, I guess. <laughs> okay. Um, when he couldn't recreate it, I'm like, all right. And I walk, walked into his office and I said, okay, tell me what you did. Take me through the process. But I don't know what I did. Like, I don't know how that happened. So we were in there for an hour or so, kind of going through it all. Recreate your steps, retrace everything you did that day. I said, did you write it down? Did you write down everything you did? And he showed me and he literally wrote everything he did. Then you said, but then I did this and I did this and I talked to this person at the same time. So I looked through my command line history of what I was doing on my computer and started at the beginning of the day, would start a Zoom call, would run the commands that I had run on my computer. Completely separate from the actual attack, was I plugging something in to my computer that was causing some glitch on the Trezor that happened to be connected? I just could not replicate what I did. So he was really defeated and he can do anything. So I, in my mind. My wife kept saying, you know, computers, do what they're told, which generally is true unless you force it to do something unintentional, which is kind of what we're doing. I slept on it, woke up, came downstairs, looked through the source code of the Trezor device because I figured at some point in that process, that recovery seed and that pin had to be moved into that RAM area that I was able to access through my debug interface. This is exactly why I can perform my attack. This memcopy function right here, I checked future versions of firmware. This was 1.6.0. In 1.6.1, the next small revision, that function had been removed and the whole memory structure actually had been changed. It turns out that I found an area in the source code where on power up, the secret information gets copied into RAM. And then when I do my glitch to defeat the security of the chip to give me access to RAM, the contents are there and I can get them out. I felt really good to help with something that I know nothing about. <laughs> so yeah, let me give you a rundown of like the whole setup, uh, just so you can kind of get a feel for the process and what we're seeing. In order for this attack to work, we have to use a bunch of different hardware. There's a security feature inside of the microcontroller, inside of the Trezor, that prevents us from reading the memory contents. So what we need to do is figure out a way to defeat that security so we can read the memory. The security mechanism only happens on power up of the Trezor device, which means when we're doing our attack, trying to defeat that check, we need a way to power cycle the Trezor over and over and over again. In order to power cycle the Trezor, I'm using a device called the Phi Whisperer. We're just using it to power the device on and off. This glitch only works if we glitch the chip on power up. So it's something where we have to turn the device on, try to glitch it. If it doesn't work, turn the device off, turn it on. Once power to the Trezor is applied, 
we want to try to defeat the security check at exactly the right time to trick the chip into thinking that we have access to it when in reality we shouldn't. To do that, we use a tool called the Chip Whisperer and we're using an attack called a fault injection or a voltage glitch. That basically means that we're trying to force the chip into misbehaving in some way that's beneficial to us. We're basically taking advantage of the fact that electronic systems are defined to operate within specific parameters and the vendor can only guarantee functionality within that area. My question is, what happens when we operate the device outside of that? And that's what we're doing with glitching. If we can glitch the chip at just the right time, we're gonna defeat the security and then we can continue with our attack. I feel like I'm back in school. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like school, except the tools are way more powerful now. And, yeah. and the stakes are a little bit higher. A little bit higher, yeah. <laughs> the way that we know that we've properly defeated security is that the chip will enable what's called a debug mode. And a debug mode uses an external piece of hardware like this to let a legitimate engineer normally read memory and do general debugging of a microcontroller. In the case of the Trezor, if we defeat the security feature, it will enable debug mode and only let us access one particular area of memory, which is the RAM. The recovery seed and the pin, that private information that we need, is copied into RAM. We also need to modify the Trezor device to allow us to connect it up to the rest of our hardware. That's gonna look something like this. All of the hardware pieces are tied together with this custom circuit board. And if everything works properly, then we win. When Miles, my, my nine-year-old came in here and I started doing this, I'm like, it's kind of like when you're glitching a video game. Yeah. You know, and like you find, somebody finds some bug and you can skip the level or do whatever. He's like, oh, so you just have to get the timing right to, to do the glitch. And I'm like, yes. Um, okay, should we do it? You can tell I'm nervous. You're like cool and collected and I'm sitting here like tapping my feet. And <laughs> well, I, I have, it's out of my hands at this point. You wanna do it? You wanna do the handoff? Yeah, yeah, okay. let's do it. Okay, all right. Okay. Wow, there it is. Alrighty, thank you. So now that I have it, you're not allowed to touch it, right? Great, I don't wanna touch it okay. anymore. It's in cool. your hands. This is it. Millions of dollars on this exact Trezor wallet, and we're gonna uh, we're gonna hack it. Let's do it. Yeah. Okay. So, when was the last time you plugged this in? That was recently, right? So yeah. Like a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we know it worked then. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plug it in to my computer, make sure that it actually confirms the firmware. So it seems to function so far. So now my computer is gonna communicate with this device. See what happens. Okay, firmware is out of date. That's good. So this is 1.6.0. Everything is set. Sweet. Now we can go and crack it open and start. The one risk that we face here is breaking something as we're opening the case. So I'm doing really light cuts here. I can feel it, part of, part of it's getting through. damage on that side. Ta-da! It has the conformal coating on it, which is the protective layer uh, to protect the components. So that makes it a little bit harder for us to solder to the connections. So my next step is to apply some chemicals to get rid of that coating and then start soldering wires. like to get it as clean as possible. And sticker is off. I'm gonna use a conformal coating remover pen and really we just need it over the connector that we're gonna to solder to and over the components that we're gonna remove. Otherwise, if we try to solder to those connections, they might not make a good connection. Now that hard epoxy just kind of peels right yeah. out. I think that's good. I'm gonna check it on the magnifying glass just to be sure it's actually removed. Okay, we're good to go. 
The next step is we have to remove a couple components from this board. The components we're removing are capacitors, and by removing them, it makes the chip more susceptible to those little glitches and stuff that we're doing. What I'm gonna do is use my soldering iron and just very carefully heat both sides of the part and pull it off the board. The risk at this stage is pulling off some of the circuit board with it, uh, which hopefully won't happen. Iron is on. Yeah, there's two that we need to remove. One is easier to get to than the other. Okay, first one's off. Got it. All right, so those components are off. Now all I have to do is add the external connectors that's gonna let us hook it up to the hardware over there. It is prepped and ready. Let the glitching begin. <laughs> How you feeling now? Uh, that's crazy stuff. So I'm gonna plug in our different hardware. Plug that into this connector. There's an eyelash on the table. Now let's get our scope on. This guy up. <sighs> and so when I start this, it's gonna start our full glitch attack and it's gonna go step by step trying the different glitch offsets um, until it hits. Let's just run the loop. So this is the main loop. It's gonna power cycle, check over and over again if the debug interface is opened. Soon as it works, we get that device ID, then we know it's wide open for us. Uh, I'm gonna start it. Ready? I'm ready. Here we go. So now we wait. This is it. It's the police stakeout. Yeah. We sit here and eat donuts. <laughs> and then a couple hours later, something good happens. <laughs> Should we take bets on how long it's going to take? I'll, I'll say it goes, it's going to go within, within an hour. One hour. I'm gonna I'm gonna say it's gonna be between three and four hours. Okay. Or it doesn't go within four hours, and that that's a possibility too. I mean, it could could take longer. It could take six hours. It could yeah. take more because we're only testing one a second, and we're going through a pretty wide range of about ten thousand attempts. Uh, but it might need to go through another loop before it hits it. So we don't really know. Hopefully, we don't have to stay overnight. Uh, but we're just gonna let it run until it happens. So what was happening is I was sitting here for hours at a time, just looking, making sure the lights were blinking. And it got to the point where I was like, I just want to like use my computer for other stuff. So I made a little audible thing in here. It's going to say, say a little phrase the planet. Uh, <laughs> when it comes up, which is actually really strange because you're just sitting here and then it says it and you're like, oh, shit, it worked. Um, I'm going to go for a pepperoni. Sweet. Vegan pepperoni. It blinking. I see the, I see the J Link blinking, and that makes me feel good. What's actually interesting is there's sort of these like repeatable spikes here, which I don't remember seeing before. It's like one kilohertz. It's really interesting. So these spikes, I'm guessing, are going to be from the lights. So if that's the case, we might want to change some of the lighting. Oh, you think the lighting, the light and the frequency it might the be lights. causing some issue. I mean, it still might work, but I'm curious because this doesn't match what I saw. So if you turn on the lights, scope. you think the spikes go away. Yeah. So that's got to be something that wasn't something that here was not, yeah, when I was doing the testing before. Can we kill? Let's kill the lights. Let's see what happens. Cool. Let me try this one. Still there? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. I think it's this one. 
Still there. Still there. How about this one? Still there. Wireless mic? Yeah, let's... I mean, it could still glitch fine, we have no idea. But that just makes me a little nervous. Um, I'm gonna disconnect this guy. None of this should matter, because it was all plugged in before, but to be safe. It's still there. No, let me turn off the robot lights. Okay, hold that there. I'm gonna power everything back on. Yeah, it's still there. It's that same repeating with that glitching. Well, I have a ground here that's shared, but I'm thinking like... That might be... <laughs> Don't tell anyone. <laughs> Don't forget your ground clip, kids. <laughs> That's like engineering 101. <laughs> it's almost always a stupid problem too. Yeah. And what's interesting is we were seeing the spikes because the ground wasn't connected, but the chip was still seeing the right thing all the time. Uh, but now it's set, our signal looks way better. This thing looks like it's happily glitching. And now we wait. Now we wait. Yeah. Oh, pizza's here. Nice. The fuel of hackers. It's good. Good. It's got a little kick to it. If I start acting erratically and lunging at the circuitry, throw me to the ground. <laughs> There's like nothing to do. There's literally nothing to do. Come on. This is, this is torture. Hack the planet. Oh! Yes. I'm like, this is torture. Hack the planet. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Oh my god. OMG, like they say on the internet. <laughs> okay, so that was um, three hours and three hours and 19 minutes, which is right within that sweet spot. Oh my god. <laughs> but now the question is, is that too far in the boot process? Did we miss an earlier glitch that's going to keep the contents in memory? So I don't want to find out. I'm already shaking. All right, I gotta move. I'm too excited. <laughs> this is the literal money shot. Yeah. Right? Like, this is the money shot. Okay, so, so we glitched it. Now I'm going to run the external program to extract the RAM. Okay, we've successfully copied the RAM out of the device. Now we can run strings and look at that file which has been sucked <laughs> off of this device. So we're done with this hardware. If the contents are in the RAM, we have it on my computer right now. I'm so nervous right now, you don't even understand. I don't know if you can see, like, sweaty palms. Sweaty palms. <laughs> All right, okay, ready? Three, two, one. Ah! <laughs> yeah, buddy! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> one, two, five, one, four. We did it! <laughs> That's how you hack a wallet. All that pain and suffering. Oh, that actually reminds me. Um, can you pay me now? Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. Oh my god. It was like that pause between clicking that command and seeing it come up is like, <gasps> oh, oh. Dude, I'm gonna get that. <laughs> oh yeah, gonna... three theta. Look at that. So oh, that's it. One, two, five, one, four. And he thought it was one, two, one, five or something like that. Clay got four out of the five, that's... Yeah. <laughs> I have something to tell you. I know. You texted mommy that it worked. How do you know it worked? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Yay! Yay!
Yay! Thanks for the support. Oh, only effort. Oh. Oh. <laughs> How did you feel? Happy. Why? It's because you finished it. It's cool that my dad's a hacker. Thanks, that was cool. I was sort of skeptical about it, especially when he told me how much money there was on it. I was like, that's really risky. Well, I knew he was going to do it, so I wasn't as excited and shocked as I thought I'd be. I mean, I was happy, very happy for him and everybody, but I, it wasn't a surprise. This is what he needed. I've been telling him for years that he needed something other than teaching. He needed to do something else. And I always say, like, you have this skill set, so why are you not using it to the fullest potential? So this helped him realize his strengths and his gifts. Been a pleasure. Yeah, it has been. <sighs> that was emotionally draining. About a year, probably a little bit less, we thought, at least I thought, that we were never gonna see this money again. The coins were gone forever. Now we just went on this emotional roller coaster that's come to an end. Um, man, that was crazy. This project was a perfect example of what hardware hacking is all about. The trials and the errors and the failures and the successes uh, and having it all culminate in this final attack where we could extract the recovery seed from a protected microcontroller. One thing that Trezor does really well is they keep track of all of the security vulnerabilities that people have found and reported to them. We don't see that a lot in the hardware space. The fact that Trezor has a website where they publish all of that information, acknowledge that they're problems and fix them is something that really should be applauded. What we did with this hardware wallet is only just the beginning. There are so many people out there with challenges, whether other people have forgotten their passwords that we need to pull off of devices, or they have other pieces of technology that they need to extract some piece of information from. If you have some crazy story needing help with technology, with cryptocurrency, getting your passwords off, feel free to reach out. I'm always looking for new puzzles and new challenges, and I'm ready to take it on.